Welcome back to the Farm Bits podcast for our third episode in the Quantifying Soil Spatial Variability series and our 10th episode overall. It is hard for us to believe that it is already the 10th episode. No kidding. <laughs> in today's episode, we're going to feature Dr. Trenton Frowns, Associate Professor in the School of Natural Resources at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Trenton will tell you a little bit more about his background, specifically educationally during the episode, but his specialty is in hydrogeophysics. In practice, his research focuses on measuring spatial soil properties to better understand how water moves in agroecosystems and how we can use this knowledge to improve water management in agriculture. Through his research, he has extensive experience with using instruments to map soil properties such as soil moisture content, organic matter, and other variables that matter to crop production. In this episode, we are focusing on how measurements get turned into maps and what these maps can be used for. Trenda will describe measurement technologies, how the data collected is turned into maps, and what the value proposition of this information is for farmers. So with that introduction, let's jump into our discussion with Trenton. So yeah, thanks for joining us. Yeah. And uh, do you want to start off by telling us a little bit about your background and what got you started working in this field and in agriculture? Yep. So I grew up in Colorado, kind of extended families uh, in the water area, a lot of water engineers in my family. Uh, some real extended relatives in uh, agriculture in uh, eastern Colorado, but nothing uh, uh, immediate in my family. You know, and after that, I went on to uh, uh, University of Wyoming, uh, where I played uh, football and got degrees in uh, civil engineering. Then uh, did my uh, PhD work after that at Princeton uh, in civil and environmental engineering, and then went on to do a postdoc at University of Arizona, uh, really where I got into this uh, soil moisture mapping uh, technology that, that we'll talk about later on. And so really, really my background's in the water area. And then when, when I took a job at uh, UNL, uh, you know, it became pretty clear that, you know, water and agriculture are so, uh, you know, tied together, you know, we use about 90% of our water uh, in this state for agriculture. So it seemed like a natural fit to, to move into that space. Sure, that's really cool. And I think I remember you telling me at one point in time, when I talked to you previously, you did a little bit of work in Africa as well during your, your PhD research there at, at Princeton. Yep, so I did all of my field work uh, in Kenya as part of a, uh, a water and ecology uh, project. So I uh, lived in a tent uh, out on the savanna working with the Maasai for, you know, six to eight weeks at a time. So that was uh, some interesting field work there. So I don't miss living uh, in a tent. <laughs> <laughs> so your current research right now, like you mentioned, is working with soil properties to quantify soil moisture kind of in, in real time and, and working at this agriculture and water interface. Um, and it's my understanding that you use some high-tech soil property measuring devices to help us better inform water management decisions uh, and agricultural production in general. Uh, so can you describe a little bit more of your research uh, in detail for us right now here at the University of Nebraska? Uh, yep. Yeah. So uh, really into uh, you know, geophysical sensors and remote sensing. Now we can use some of these new cool tools and technology uh, to look at uh, you know, water efficiency. So I uh, work with a lot of uh, uh, different technologies from electromagnetic induction to uh, neutron detection to gamma ray detection. And these uh, instruments are, are nice because they have uh, a lot of them are um, passive sensors and non-contact. And so that way uh, you can really uh, scale them up and map entire fields instead of, you know, sticking a probe in the ground and, and moving around, you know, 160 acres is we can drive these on vehicles or tow them behind uh, tractors and that sort of thing. So it really allows us to get to the uh, uh, scale that we need for agriculture. That's awesome. We've seen these, some of your fancy sensors in the truck. So I know it's awesome to see, maybe we can share some pictures, but. Sure. Yep. Um, yeah. Uh, so what do you think is the most important or some of the most important soil properties to measure when quantifying spatial variability? Yep. Yeah, so, so really we have the, uh, the, you know, the challenge that we can measure, you know, these geophysical properties, you know, like uh, electromagnetic properties or neutron properties. And the challenge is to convert those into uh, you know, useful things in agriculture. So, you know, it's, it's nice to have, you know, uh, measurements of uh, soil moisture, uh, but really what we're at is, you know, uh, the properties that control flow of water and nutrients through soil. And so we have to, you know, connect these state variables like soil moisture uh, with the fluxes of water and nutrients. And that's really the biggest uh, challenge is, is making that uh, connection. Uh, so for, you know, irrigation scheduling, things like 
uh, quantifying uh, you know, soil field capacity and soil wilting point are, are really critical uh, for defining those uh, irrigation uh, trigger points of that particular patch of soil. Uh, so, so for that, that would be important for irrigation. Uh, on the uh, you know, sort of nutrient uh, management side, you know, things like organic uh, matter, uh, organic carbon, those sorts of things are, are probably of, of most interest. I was going to add on to that. Is it difficult sometimes to find like a correlation to an exact physical property? So for example, if whether it's just high levels of clay or if it's compaction, um, I mean, do you have to do several different managements to maybe differentiate those things or, you know, some of those different measurements that you're doing? Yep. So for, you know, the different instruments sort of are most suited to a particular property. So for electromagnetic properties, those are very tightly correlated to clay percent. Uh, for the neutrons, those are nice. Those are directly correlated to uh, the mass of hydrogen or soil moisture. And for the gamma ray detection, those are more about the uh, sort of underlying uh, geology uh, of the system. And so the, the next trick is then converting that into, into something uh, useful. So it's kind of, a, kind of a puzzle where you have some of the pieces and not all of them. You're kind of trying to stitch it uh, together um, to come up with a, you know, a useful picture of what's uh, happening at the site. So it's uh, I guess that's why it's it's kind of fun to do is it's you know it's a it's a real big challenge you don't really have fully complete information uh, uh, to make these uh, sort of uh, you know inferences about these things. So it sounds like for a, a grower out there who's looking at using some of these technologies and maybe adding these these property measurements to their repertoire, it, they're kind of a complementary set of data in addition to traditional soil sampling for them, right? Because in order to get a good measurement of the actual uh, nitrogen, for example, or phosphorus or potassium that you have in the field, uh, this is just good uh, additional information to complement what they may get off of a traditional soil sample. Is that kind of correct? Uh, yep. So here? that's kind of how I view it. Is we, uh, you know, we always will still do soil sampling just because that's our ground truth. And so kind of how I view it is, you know, is making that correlation uh, between the, the soil properties that we get from the laboratory and what we get with the uh, imagery. And so, uh, you know, we can combine multiple layers. Another big one is, you know, elevation uh, is really important to take into account uh, or, you know, drainage area for particular uh, slopes. Uh, those, are, those are also important. And so we, we want as many different layers of data as possible to make that, uh, that correlation and that uh, connection. Uh, and once we have multiple layers of information, we can start to use some of these more advanced statistical techniques like machine learning, and AI to help uh, build that correlation structure and make better predictions of soil uh, properties uh, everywhere. So uh, kind of how I view it is let's uh, trade some of that soil sampling. We don't have to take as many locations. We can put that budget or time and effort into uh, uh, soil mapping and still get uh, better results and, and hopefully uh, you know the same type of cost for that type of data. That's awesome. Uh, you've already mentioned a few of the on-the-go soil mapping technologies that you have, um, but can you maybe tell us if there's any more that you haven't mentioned so far and which of these technologies are gaining the most traction? Yep, so a lot of companies out there. So uh, Varus has been used a, a long time using electrical resistivity, so that's going to be very similar to electromagnetics. Uh, so another company out there is a, a dual EM, uh, which is widely used by uh, CropMetrics, CropX. Uh, Soil Optics, another company out there that uses uh, gamma ray uh, uh, technology. And then also uh, uh, Tremble is using several of these techniques. And then uh, Smart Firmer uh, is integrating some of these sensors right with the, uh, you know, the planting of the, of the actual uh, seeds. So yeah, so it's kind of the, the wild west out there of all these uh, different techniques. And <laughs> we're trying to figure out kind of which one, you know, is the most useful and most uh, cost effective you know, to get some of these, uh, you know, actionable decisions. So you, you've mentioned a couple other sensors that, that you particularly use in your research, uh, including kind of cosmic ray detector uh, and the gamma ray detector, stuff like that. Um, are, are those just emergent technologies that we're still trying to figure out what place they might have in uh, measuring properties for ag? Yeah, so I mean, honestly, these technologies have been used since the late 1940s and 1950s. And some of the, you know, increases in electronics and cost of the sensors have come down and kind of, you know, trickled through, you know, various scientific uh, disciplines. So I think they're, you know, just starting to, you know, make it uh, more widespread into agriculture as we kind of, you know, uh, 
uh, some of the technology, you know, of, of how we apply water or, you know, fertilizer catches up to some of these uh, instruments. So I think now that we, you know, have the ability to apply water and fertilizer in these spatial management zones, we now, you know, uh, find to play catch up with what are some of the techniques to get that underlying data that we need to optimize that process. Yeah, absolutely. So, so when these technologies are, are measuring soil properties, what we're getting back on the other end is point data. Uh, and there, that's basically measurements that are taken at certain locations within a field, but maybe not be continuously measured throughout a field. Uh, and so the distance between these points can vary laterally and longitudinally, um, which kind of creates a, a different data resolution for each different data layer that we might get from these mapping technologies. Um, and, and I think we see the same with soil sampling. Some people do zonal soil sampling, some people do grid soil sampling. So when you have point data like this, how can you actually take this data and turn it into a continuous map that describes spatial variability across an entire field that, that folks can use uh, practically in their operations? Yep, so that's a, you know, a, a great practical as well as sort of you know, theoretical question of, of how we do this, you know, what I call upscaling of these uh, soil properties. So you know, one thing that you know, I've dug a lot of holes in my life as part of uh, research, one thing I found is that you know, if you were say to you know sample within a field, uh, you know, ten uh, point data with inside say a, a ten by ten meter grid, uh, you would have about as as much variability between those point samples and that ten by ten meter grid average is if you took ten by ten meter grids and then uh, upscale that to your entire you know, you know sixty five uh, hectares wow. or one hundred and sixty uh, hectares. Okay. So there's just a ton of variability that exists at that that point scale. Uh, when, when you aggregate it up to sort of, you know, the, you know, management zone scale. So the nice thing about the geophysics is often these are, uh, uh, the way the sensor works is it's integrating over some of those uh, uh, smaller distances for us. So, you know, how far an EM wave propagates, how far do, you know, neutrons or gamma rays mix, is it's doing that averaging for us at the small scale. And so that's really, really what, you know, the advantage of these instruments is we don't get that fine scale uh, variability that you get from point samples. And so that makes it a, a little easier uh, to you know, upscale that, that process and fill in the parts of the map. The challenge is that when you compare a point sensor to sort of the, you know, this 10 meter scale, you have a lot of you know, variability still. So you know, your correlation may only be 50 or 70% uh, because it's just, it's just hard to match up those you know, very fine scale with sort of this intermediate scale. So. Uh, it's a, a mouthful there, but uh, I think it kind of makes sense when you start thinking think about these things, you know, practically and going out there and actually doing some sampling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So building on this discussion on point data, um, can you potentially explain for our listeners what interpolation means and what are some potential issues associated with interpolation? Yep. So this is basically, you know, how we take a, you know, a series of, of points points in an area and we, how we fill in those missing pieces of uh, data. And so, uh, you know, you want to build basically this, the structure of, you know, how correlated your points are versus how far apart they are. And so that's called a, a variogram. And so you can use that relationship between distance between your measurements and how correlated they are to do that uh, uh, filling in of that uh, information. And so the, the challenge of that is you need about, uh, you know, 100 to 120 points in order for that uh, relationship uh, to work. You know, that's, that's a lot of soil sampling in order to make that work. And so yeah, instead, <laughs> what, what we like to do is, uh, you know, build that correlation between maybe 10 or 20 point samples uh, between the geophysics and then use that geophysical map uh, to help fill in that uh, interpolation. So uh, getting a little technical, we'd probably call that uh, co-creating uh, or, um, uh, this is the, uh, the term here. Uh, basically, you find that uh, uh, regression creating, excuse me, that's the term I'm looking for. So you build that uh, regression and then you add in that uh, relationship between how correlated points are uh, as you uh, increase that separation distance. Very cool. Yeah, it's, <laughs> I know Sam and I, we took a class on soil spatial variability <laughs> uh, last spring and did a little bit of creating, but certainly not, uh, not to the extent that you had to go out and take 120 soil samples for that would have been. No, and then if you're doing it at the two and a half acre grid, which is pretty, mm -hmm. you know, normal for people, that's a large area of land or, a, like I said, a lot of samples. So, 
So how much does that sampling resolution that Sam just, just kind of mentioned, the two and a half acre grids, impact the outcome of, of creating an interpolation? So if you had a one acre grid sample versus a two and a half acre grid sample versus maybe a five acre grid sample, how much does that can affect the outcome? Yep, so I mean, I think, you know, you'll probably get the same average value once you get to about, you know, 20 or 30 points inside of your area versus 60, you should get a very similar average value. It's really gonna be sort of that, uh, you know, standard deviation or, or that variability is what the part that you're going to uh, miss. You know, so it really depends on, you know, how are you managing your field? Are you doing it, you know, one uniform treatment of water and fertilizer, then it's probably not going to matter that much. But if you're breaking your field into, you know, two degree sort of pie slices, then yeah, you're going to want to capture that uh, variability. So it really, you know, is, you know, the sampling has to go with how you're going to actually you know, implement that uh, management and what you want to invest in. And how do you get a return on that? And that's that's really the, the big challenge is, is, you know, what is, you know, practical and pragmatic for management versus what is that underlying variability in your field? And that's, you know, what we are trying to figure out, so. Mm -hmm. It's also dependent a lot on what you're trying to measure, correct? So like organic matter may not vary as much as nitrate, for instance. Yeah, exactly. So all of these things, you know, they have a, you know, a natural distribution of, you know, how the, you know, the sediment was laid down, how it was weathered, and then how you've managed it over the years. And so, you know, that's a big challenge. You kind of need some of that history in order to figure out what is that sort of pattern of variability. And so that's kind of like we like the geophysics is that kind of, you know, a quick run of that, you can kind of tell what that underlying structure is and kind of what that you know, basic picture looks like by, by running over with the geophysics, so. So for somebody who's out there that's that's taking these soil samples or running the dual EM, uh, running the various, what are some practical steps that they can take to ensure the best possible quality data uh, is going into that creating an interpolation procedure for the best possible outcomes? Yep, so in an ideal world, uh, you would go out and you would, you know, do a, a geophysical map, say with a dual EM or Varus, you kind of look at that as well as an elevation map and you could pick your sampling locations uh, based off of uh, sort of you know what those two maps look like. So some uh, USDA soil salinity lab has a nice piece of software, I think it's called ESAP, uh, where you can put in those layers and they'll actually pick smart uh, sampling locations uh, for you. Uh, often though we, we don't have that luxury, we're kind of doing that uh, sort of, uh, you know, we sample and then we do the geophysics or sort of a mixture of that. And so that, that's the challenge is, uh, you know, kind of uh, matching these things uh, together. But, uh, you know, I think we can get away with fewer uh, soil samplings in the field if we do, do smart sampling. So that's kind of uh, uh, been my uh, experience is, you know, we can probably reduce that by, you know, half uh, or 75% by uh, including some of these geophysical maps. Mm -hmm. So as you mentioned, I think a couple questions ago, um, all of this data only matters for how we're applying it or how we're using it. Uh, so what are these maps being useful for in terms of annual decision making or long term decision making or what are you seeing a lot of people how they're applying it. Yep. So, so I think, you know, crop metrics is, uh, you know, one of the leaders uh, in this area initially of, you know, how do you take this uh, imagery and turn it into, you know, uh, irrigation scheduling, as well as, you know, uh, uh, planting density, you know, if you want to vary your seed population, uh, there's some uh, algorithms they've uh, developed uh, uh, for that. Um, in addition, I, you know, I think, uh, you know, the, the gamma ray gives you a little bit different information. You get some more some of the soil uh, chemical property information, some more of the, uh, you know, what Barris is getting you, the organic uh, uh, matter, and getting in more to some of the uh, uh, nitrogen uh, management. So, um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, it used for sort of all of the above and you know, it's still kind of, uh, you know, unknown what the optimal way to use this uh, data is. It kind of depends on the company and, you know, you know who's using uh, this data set. So there's no sort of, you know, right prescribed uh, equation right now that we're using, so. Sure. And so since this is kind of an emerging area of research, what have you seen to be the most effective soil property layers so far for characterizing spatial variability say as it relates to yield within a field? Yep, so, so uh, what I found, uh, we have a, a new publication on this, is really that, you know, elevation is probably the, the primary uh, controlling factor, uh, followed by some measure of soil variability, whether that be through, you know, varus 
uh, dual EM uh, or soil moisture mapping, we've kind of find that as a, a secondary factor. So the nice thing about that is, you know, elevation data is pretty much widely available, freely available through LIDAR or your, you know, your uh, combine or your planner. Typically you can pull those layers off. And so that's a very, you know, low hanging fruit out there is to look at your, your elevation data. Um, also remote sensing. So if you, uh, you know, have some of these tools you can get at, you know, things like uh, Landsat imagery and compute uh, things like peak growing season greenness, as we found as a, as a pretty good uh, metric. Yeah. Uh, so it's kind of, uh, and again, that's freely available uh, data. And then also your previous year's yield maps are gonna be your best predictor of next year's yield. So it's kind of a, a mixture of those uh, different layers uh, together. So elevation's great, previous year's yield. And then if you wanna get more to the remote sensing products, some of the Landsat uh, uh, archive is, is pretty nice to get into that. I think that's awesome that you mentioned a bunch of like freely available resources or things that farmers already have at their disposal. They don't have to go necessarily buy a really fancy sensor. <laughs> so that's awesome. Yep. No, I, I fully uh, uh, utilize the free stuff. And then after that, see, see what you need, you know, that's mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. Uh, which one did you ask the spatial layers and do you want me to ask the? Yeah, I talked about 10. I, I guess I was going to, going to kind of follow up okay. Trenton. Um, I was watching one of your presentations here recently. I think it was from the Cosmos conference in Germany um, that you sent when we were preparing for this, this podcast. Uh, and you mentioned a technique of basically synthesizing multiple different soil property layers into kind of a, a single explanatory variable. I think the, the um, acronym for that was EOF, which you mentioned is similar to like a principal component analysis. Could you explain a little bit about how that works and how that is able to combine multiple soil spatial variability layers into something that is explanatory of yield? Yep. So we'll get uh, real nerdy here and into some linear algebra, <laughs> unfortunately. So uh, hopefully, we won't scare off too many of your listeners. But uh, yeah, so this is a nice uh, technique where you have the same layer that you collect multiple times over the year or many years. Uh, and this uh, technique basically allows you to split that uh, spatial temporal data into uh, spatial and temporal components separately. And so uh, it's a little different from principal component analysis, which basically uh, aligns it into your principal axes, but it's not a space and time uh, component necessarily. So, so the upshot is that is basically is you can remove all the time varying effects from these uh, data sets. So uh, Varus, uh, uh, dual EM, any of these things are going to be affected by things like soil temperature, soil moisture on the day that you collect uh, that property. And so this uh, uh, statistical techniques allows you to uh, filter out those time varying components and just focus on what the spatial patterns are. So again, that, that's a mouthful, but basically uh, uh, how we're using is we're trying to distill basically what is the underlying spatial properties uh, uh, from this uh, sort of data that can vary from uh, day to day and depending on you know, what time of year that you collect it. I think that makes a lot of sense to us because, you know, we do a lot of work with imagery and imagery can change week to week that some of those underlying soil properties are going to be influencing how that crop performs in certain areas of the field. And it sounds like that technique basically narrows it down to what are those consistent underlying properties that we're working on. And same thing with the historical yield maps. We've used this on, you know, if you have four or five yield maps of, you know, corn or soybean, the same crop, is you can really identify your underlying spatial variability of what your yield looks like. And so it's a, uh, that's probably the, the easiest way to make management zones, my opinion, is to take some of those historical yield maps and then run it through a technique like this to try and really find those, you know, like zones that sort of uh, uh, work as a, a single unit. So clustering is kind of another way to do that, but I think this is, uh, it sounds complicated, but it is actually very straightforward when you run it through a statistical package, so. That's awesome. And you led us right into what we wanted to discuss next. So we do talk about management zones a lot in our research, just because it does apply to that site-specific management. Um, it can vary your nutrient management or your planting. Uh, so how does the information that you're collecting or how does this information help us to better select the variables we use to generate management zones, which I think is kind of what he just talked about. Or do you want to keep going? Yeah, we, uh, yeah. Okay. We'll talk about it a little bit. 
if you want to elaborate on how sure. yeah. the different variables are used to generate management zones. Yep. So, so again, historical yield, that seems like the no brainer to use if you're, you know, looking at yield is that that's obviously going to be your, your best, uh, you know, variable if you have that. Uh, nice thing if you don't have historical yield for whatever reason is remote sensing can help fill in some of that. So there's some nice, uh, this greenness uh, index that I mentioned uh, is a nice one for that's very correlated to a, a yield that they found uh, through, uh, you know, various uh, uh, studies. So, so you can sort of recreate some of that historical yield uh, if you don't actually uh, have it. Uh, so first thing is you're going to kind of how many pick, uh, how many management zones you want. You know, if you're comfortable with, you know, three, five, or seven, is that can really help sort of define, you know, the algorithm and the constraints on that uh, clustering algorithm. Uh, so that would be kind of the first thing is, you know, what can I feasibly you know, manage for this field? Is it three zones? Is it five? Is it seven? And that will really help constrain, you know, that, that statistical uh, algorithm. So, you know, from, you know, talking to you know, various farmers, it seems like three to five zones is kind of the, you know, the sweet spot uh, right now. Once you're getting more into that, you get more into automation and just too time consuming and it's pretty, pretty challenging uh, to manage. So, so yeah, I think you can, you know, run some of these clustering techniques, you know, if you, uh, ahead of time pick you know three to five zones and that will really narrow down kind of what those management zones look like and, and whether or not they sort of look reasonable you know if you're trying to manage the same thing and you know three different spots in your field is that that's not very helpful so you kind of have to you know pick contiguous zones where you can actually feasibly manage that with your equipment so this might be getting out of the scope a little bit of what we want to talk about, but a previous graduate student in our lab did some research on how different fields have different variables that influence management zones more. So like if a field is really hilly, it elevation means a lot more than a field that's flat, which seems very, you know, intuitive. But do you have like some ways to test like, you know, which ones you want to use in your clustering? Okay. Yeah, no, that's a that's a great question. So I mean, I think some of this comes to sort of, you know, basic field knowledge, you know, that's coming from the producers is, you know, uh, you know, we can, we can only do so much with, you know, the, the statistics, but it's really that deep knowledge that, you know, the producers have that you want to build into those management zones and have the, you know, the remote sensing and the geophysics help supplement that is kind of what I would say. So, you know, you know, if this field is, you know, rocky in certain spots, you're gonna to have to build that information in because you know we're probably gonna see it with the geophysics, but you really wanna you know sort of constrain, you know, how do you how do you make that algorithm work based off of your local knowledge, I think is, is critical. So that's an awesome response. We've been told that before. We said hand a farmer a map of their field and have them draw the management zones for you. <laughs> so exactly. There you know. Yeah. So yeah, I'm just I'm sitting here thinking about that response. It's <laughs> it's super interesting because we want to approach a lot of these problems with the data, with the math, and try to um, make everything consistent and fit every single field. But the reality is that there probably will always be a human component to what we're doing um, and experience because we're I guess we're just not going to ever be able to collect enough data uh, over enough years to to get there. Yeah, the, the real world's messy, you know, unfortunately. It's <laughs> dirty, yeah. you know, soil. We call it soil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can't call it dirt. Don't worry. Same <laughs> yep. Um, okay, so what are some variables? I know we've, we've talked about a lot of variables so far, but are there any variables out there that you believe are either uh, undervalued, underutilized, or that you're really looking forward to testing for yourself to see how they may impact crop performance or water use metrics. Uh, yeah, so you know, variables in terms of like what techniques we're using or like uh, you know the organic matter that kind of variable. I guess what do you what do you mean by that? Sure. So I, I guess I think this one is on like the variables like organic matter, and the next yes. one can be on techniques. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just don't know if there's one that, that is basically, I guess what I'm getting at is, is there a variable that's particularly hard to measure or that we're just starting to be able to really measure for the first time that you're excited about that may have an influence on crop Yep, no, so my primary area is soil moisture. So that's one that we've, you know, struggled with to get spatial information at sort of the, the right scale for agriculture. So, you know, we have great Soil moisture products from remote sensing that are, you know, 10 kilometers. So that's not very useful for most, you know, agricultural applications. And we have uh, point sensors that, you know, measure, uh, you know, the size of a, you know, a basketball. So also uh, pretty challenging. So, 
Uh, so with the uh, cosmic ray sensor, we're able to get, you know, sort of 20 to 30 meter uh, resolution uh, data for soil moisture over the top foot or 30 centimeters. And so we're, we're excited about sort of that, you know, new scale that we're able to uh, quantify. So, so, you know, all of the sort of, uh, you know, theory and modeling tells us that, you know, soil moisture and how it changes over time and space should be, you know, the best predictor of evapotranspiration and then uh, crop yield. And so we're, we're excited about, you know, making that connection between soil moisture and the history of soil moisture and what's going to happen uh, with the yield. So it's still ongoing research and, and, and pretty challenging, but I think that's, you know, really, uh, you know, what, what, what really gets me excited is making that better connection between soil moisture uh, and crop yield. What about nitrates? Because our research is in nitrogen, so we're just really curious. <laughs> right, yep, yeah, no, uh, fortunately I didn't do well in environmental chemistry, so I'm not <laughs> the best person to ask that, but kind of how I view it is if we get the water piece right in the soil, then we have a chance at getting the, the nitrogen piece right in the soil, because you really need that flow of water and how it's connected to the nitrogen cycle and carbon cycle, really in order to pin that down. So I'm definitely not, you know, an expert uh, in that. I kind of stop with the, the movement of water through the soils and then let, uh, you know, folks like yourself figure out the nitrogen piece. So um, <laughs> I, I think we can do a better job of, of mapping organic matter and organic carbon. Uh, in the soil, and I think that is going to be a you know a critical piece uh, for helping resolve some of those uh, some of those issues. But uh, again, that's that's not my primary area. So, yeah, that's 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 really interesting. You know, we've we deal with nitrate leaching a lot here in Nebraska, and obviously, nitrate is probably the the chemical within the soil that moves the most similarly to how water moves uh, in the soil profile. So, I I definitely agree that that your assessment of Understanding water is the first step to understanding nitrogen for us. I mean, I mean an example, like we, we map certain fields, you know, multiple times, and we know where the wet spart, parts of the fields are consistently wet over and over again. You know, that's probably going to be in a depression or, or some other zone like that or some type of soil property. So we know that those are going to be the, the highest potential for nitrogen leaching is, is where you have those wetter spots of the field that are consistently wet over time. So that would be, you know, sort of where I would, would start sampling is where you have these, you know, uh, uh, consistently wet spots in the field. Awesome. So keep up the good work then. That way yeah. our research gets better. And hopefully we can uh, count on somebody else to figure out the uh, on-the-go nitrate mapping to make yeah. our labs a little bit better, right? Uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's a tough one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what techniques and technologies do you believe are on the horizon to play a role in the future for shaping how we interpret soil property data and draw inferences from that data. That was a little mouthful. <laughs> yep. So uh, really what I'm excited about is, you know, what we, what we call opportunistic sensing. And so this is where we're going to put some of these technologies embedded right on the farm equipment. Uh, you know, if we're talking about landscapes, maybe on, you know, a mail truck or uh, some type, maybe, a, you know, a train moving through the landscape. Uh, so we do this all the time in, you know, commercial aircraft as we put sensors uh, on those things and we use that data in our, our weather models. That's so why can't we do the same thing, uh, you know, in, in farming or, or you know, regional uh, hydrology. And so, you know, it's a big challenge, you know, to, to work with, you know, these, you know, private industry or, or uh, individuals, but I think there's, you know, some opportunities through co-ops or the companies to get some of these, uh, you know, sensors on, you know, communal sprayers uh, or detasselers or something like that so we can collect these uh, data sets. You know, if we're collecting at scale and the cost comes down to something that's very reasonable as well, these sensors are, you know, pretty expensive up front. You know, they, they last a long time, um, but, you know, that initial upfront cost is pretty challenging. So I think we have to do some sort of, you know, community sharing uh, of those uh, initial costs. So, so what, what does that system look like? I guess one, one question I have in my mind right now is, number one, how often do these properties need to be mapped? Uh, or is it just something that needs to be mapped once and then you're and you're good to go? Because that, I think that would be one question I would have as far as that system. You know, do, do they need to be put on a planter every five years, for example, in order to, to keep accurate data coming in? Yep, no, great question. Uh, what we found is, you know, for running this EOF technique you mentioned, that we need about three or five maps at different water temperature or soil temperatures. 
And then that really distills down what the uh, underlying, you know, spatial soil properties are. So, and those aren't going to change greatly over time, you know, on the order of, you know, probably decades, depending on your uh, management. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, if you put it on one sprayer, maybe after two or three years, you'd have enough data sets to run this uh, analysis and you wouldn't have to, to redo that. Or, you know, if you had more targeted, <coughs> excuse me, uh, approaches where you had, you know, a, you know, so, you know, a private company, somebody with an ATV or a truck, you could, you know, map the same sort of, you know, three by three mile region, you know, over the course of a season and get sort of that, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, chunk, uh, you know, uh, uh, mapped out kind of, kind of like how they do the airborne LIDAR surveys in the state. They kind of do it in these tiles. Mm -hmm. and I imagine something similar. You could, you know, just start mapping out these tiles and eventually uh, cover the entire state. Very cool. Uh, before we get to the last question, uh, I think we may have one more too, based on the, um, but anyway, one thing that we found with like, you mentioned earlier, the elevation data uh, from like different equipment, right? And like some combines and stuff. And we look at that data and sometimes it really varies in quality. Are there other challenges with some of these sensors of whether that's the RTK like GPS or other things that may be causing that quality to not be very good? Uh, yeah, you know, so for, you know, GPS, it's, you know, has to do with your ground stations and sort of your correction factors that you apply. Uh, you know, honestly, what, what we found is sort of the, the relative value, you know, is good enough. So as long as <laughs> the sensor is consistent with itself or the mapping period, you just work with the relative elevation data, not, you know, maybe the, the absolute value. So um, for elevation, it's nice they have completed a, a, a statewide LIDAR survey. The USGS has that data. Uh, so, you know, you gotta be a little bit savvy to go out and clip out that data <laughs> off the yeah. web, but um, uh, those data sets are, are out there through these different clearing houses. Um, uh, but that is, it is a bit of a challenge to sometimes get access to that in your correct system. So, yeah. And just, I guess, going back one more question, I just want to follow up on this piggybacking idea mm -hmm. again. Um, with piggybacking, you mentioned it's good to get the maps at different soil temperature and moisture levels uh, in order to kind of, I, I guess, span the range of soil conditions out there. Is it feasible, you think, within an, a typical agricultural year, agricultural year to collect a data set that does span those different temperature and, and soil moisture regimes, say with you know tillage, planting, spraying, um, harvesting and then maybe even a dry fertilizer application. Would you be able to, to capture all the different uh, regimes that you would want? And yeah, I think so. I mean, we're probably gonna miss the really wet end, obviously, because you're not gonna be driving over those wet soils because uh, mm -hmm. you, know, you might get stuck out there. So, <laughs> um, so you'll kind of get the medium uh, to sort of dry conditions, what, which is probably pretty good enough. You know, most of the you know, properties we care about are sort of in there in that, uh, you know, medium sort of range at least for irrigation um mm -hmm. obviously we want the wet pattern if we're talking about leaching and you know fluxes of water but uh you know it's just not really possible to collect that information you know with a vehicle so uh, but usually you know if you collect you know five or six times we found that you know we get three or four different very uh, uh images uh, from that just over the from the course of the year so um yeah you can be strategic about when you sample out there but you know Usually, you know, you'll probably find a different day if you go out, you know, three or four days later than what you have, except for maybe right now we're in a pretty, pretty serious drought. But, uh, you know, usually we have some sort of, you know, uh, a different regime after you have a rainfall event. So. Yeah. So how, how close do these sensors need to be to the soil surface in order to actually make these measurements? Because I'm thinking there are a lot of people out there in Nebraska that have pivots that, you know, maybe this could be a, a sensor you could throw on a pivot and run around dry and maybe get a good measurement when um, that soil is at one of those high moisture regimes. Yep, no, that's, that's a great idea. You know, I mean, the, the cost is a little bit high for that, but in terms of research, we've, we've put a couple of cosmic ray sensors on pivots and done cool. dry runs, mm -hmm. uh, which is pretty cool to do, uh, you know, a, a six hour revolution to get that, uh, that measurement. So yeah. uh, I know that a patent recently came out where they're putting uh, GPR on uh, actual uh, center pivots. And so they're doing uh, ground penetrating radar as the pivot rotates around. So I think there's a lot you know, of opportunity of what kind of sensors that we can use that existing infrastructure on. So I've seen GPR, uh, IRT sensors uh, mounted on pivots. So I think it's kind of, uh, you know, uh, 
there's a lot of opportunities out there what kind of you know technologies we can put on these uh, center pivots to use that as our you know basic uh, uh, infrastructure so yeah yeah they're great flash you just named a lot of acronyms. Is there like a great resource for people that can go to to maybe see what different sensors are out there and what each of them measure? Ooh, yeah. I uh, I don't know if there's sort of a one definitive one that uh, that I can think of. You know, it's kind of these companies uh, that I mentioned kind of go into to some more of the sort of techniques and how they're uh, using it. But yeah. Ooh, that's uh, that's a good one. That might be a good okay. resource uh, to build. I don't know. If, not sure if there's like a <laughs> extension article on you know sort of geophysical uh, techniques that are out there. So I know the um, uh, the journal uh, uh, Fast Times. It's a, a society of uh, uh, Sajip is the uh, acronym, but they are they're a more applied uh, a journal for uh, industry that goes into some of these uh, techniques. So that might hmm. be one uh, location, the Fast Times Journal, which has some more, you know, readable articles for a general audience compared to the journal articles. So awesome. I, can, I can send you guys that link. That'd be great. Also. Yeah, yeah that'd thanks. Be great. Okay, last question? Yep. Okay. Um, so we asked this at all of our interviews. Uh, what is one piece of advice you have for our listeners out there who are working to understand variability in their fields or interpret soil property da data to use for helping them improve their agricultural production? Yep. So I think it's, you know, work smarter, not harder. You know, we, uh, <laughs> you know, we, if you use your basic knowledge or some of these geophysical layers, I think you can do, you know, smarter sampling to re really reduce some of that workload. So, you know, the, you know, two and a half acre grid sampling is kind of a, you know, a, a first first start, but I think you can, you know, really improve that by, by you know, using some of these uh, layers or your general knowledge to help sort of, you know, reduce some of that, that labor that goes into that, so. Thank you so much to Dr. Trenton Franz for joining us today on the Farm Bits podcast. His knowledge on soil sensing technology, mapping techniques, and soil moisture data collection really demonstrated the importance of measuring and understanding spatial soil data. I thought Trenton did an excellent job of explaining how the data processing methods work and how they can be applied to get practical benefit from soil spatial variability measurements. Yeah, absolutely. I also thought his explanations were really clear uh, and they really made complex topics easier to understand. Mm -hmm. My favorite aspect of this episode was Trenton's discussion of why spatial variability has to be separated from time variability if we really want to understand the underlying variability within a field. Oh, and I also really enjoyed his discussion of how these sensors can be piggybacked onto other implements and machinery during typical farm operations to make even better use of that equipment for spatial soil sensing. Absolutely. It was very interesting. So next week, we will talk with Cora Hillness of Swap Maps about how they use spatial data to characterize management zones.